yeah. I'm gonna have to leave early, so. So yeah, it's okay. That's I, I'm totally that's not gonna be in play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't mind people we'll come and go. And stay, you know, they need to. Okay. Well, I'll let that. Uh, There's one set. more chair here. One more chair so on the side. No, not yet. So okay. you are. Okay. Well, I'm gonna have to leave early. So. <laughs> there are more chairs in there. In there. In there. Yes. Someone is in there. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Uh, so I'll. No, well, thanks for coming today. It's a, actually, I think it's a very special day. It, it feels like the first day of spring. <laughs> and when I was driving in, there were so butterflies flying every everywhere, and, was, and then now Henry's here. Uh, <laughs> uh, the birds are uh, migrating for the winter. <laughs> so I mean, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Henry. I know Henry from way back when I was uh, actually a user interfaces person. Uh, Not anymore. Not really anymore, and you know, Henry is of Mr. Programming by example. He's written the textbook that everybody uses for that, and so he's currently a computer scientist at MIT CSAIL and Media Lab, and you know he's done a lot of work on programming by demonstration, programming by example. Uh, he was working on common sense. Uh, knowledge basis when it was not popular uh, and now it's very topical uh, and so you know, he's going to give uh, a talk about a scrappy approach to common sense uh, reasoning. Henry is part of our team uh, on our Mobley proposal that uh, was just selected for funding and uh, you know, fortunately he's here for IUI, you know, so a big person in IUI. And uh, so he agreed to come and give a talk. So, you know, welcome. Thank you, Pedro. Thank Thanks, you. Sir. So I'm supposed to stand here uh, and wave to Peter uh, so he can start recording. No, I'm sorry, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here back at ISI, one of the great places in the AI world. And, uh, I have I have been here a few times. And what I'd like to do uh, uh, today is talk about a problem that I'm sure we're all interested in. You guys also have done great work in this area on uh, common sense reasoning. And this is one of the great grand challenge problems of AI. Um, and despite all the progress that AI has made, it's kind of almost embarrassing that we still can't get computers to do simple th things that are simple for people. So a computer will happily book you a plane ticket, but it doesn't know why a person would want to take a plane. It doesn't know that you can pull on a string and not push on it, and so forth. And um, that's, I think, a big reason why computers seem stupid and frustrating to people. Uh, and I think that we need to understand common sense knowledge to get the commonality of uh, interest and goals and consider be between people and computers. And I think that is the route to AI. And I spend most of my time kind of between the AI and the HCI communities. And so I spend my time in the AI community telling people they should pay attention to this for user interface. And uh, then I spend my time in the HCI community because they, they get nervous anytime there's any AI. <laughs> And you know we're not going to get to good interfaces simply by just arranging menus on the screen and stuff. So um, I'm going to give a just this talk is going to be kind of just a broad interview, a broad overview of uh, some of the work that we've been doing in this area. And then I want to and some of my personal views on what are the issues about common sense inference. And I hope to maybe spark some discussion. And uh, Pedro invited me to join the Mowgli project. So I think you know uh, I'm and I'm going to be here today talking to some of you and so uh, we'd like to just you know understand how we can work on this project how make progress on this problem so uh, a lot of you know that even ba as far back as 1958 John McCarthy who who um, coined the term artificial intelligence he wrote this paper called programs with common sense and in this paper he identified common sense as being the central problem of AI 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, the paper was about one page of it was readable, and then he went off into equations, as mathematicians do. And so this was his idea for how to deal with common sense. He would think you would have some functions, like at i desk, and then you have some rules that that applies. You could go to the desk, uh, and you know you could solve the problem of how to go uh, from home to the airport that way. So he he was a mathematician. He envisioned it as a mathematical logic problem. Because all you had to do was introduce uh, functions for uh, the various common sense predicates. And so predicates like uh, go or did don't really appear in mathematics. You know, they're about human activity. So you have to introduce those stuff, that stuff. So that was his idea for how to deal with the common sense problem. It wasn't a bad idea, okay? And uh, people are still working on it to this day. You axiomatize various um, common sense domains. And uh, Eric Mueller has a book called Common Sense Reasoning where he uh, spins out all the work that's been done on that. And so that's one component of how to do that. Uh, on the other hand, Mar and Mar I'm from MIT. I was at the original AI lab in the 70s, and then I went spent several decades at the Media Lab with uh, my colleague John M. Wado uh, here, and um, uh, and we he, he was involved in this 50 year old argument with John McCarthy uh, about you know whether mathematics was the right approach, and he. Uh, advocated an approach that was more procedural because while McCarthy was having trouble getting all his predicates to work yeah, at MIT AI lab, the hackers were writing procedural programs in LESP and uh, that, that actually solved some common sense problems like Winograd's blocks world and stuff. So he out advocated a much more procedural approach for, rather than a mathematical logic approach. Uh, and that's the tradition in which I grew up in. Um, uh, so, and one of the great common sense projects was Site Doug Lenat, uh started in, in the 80s, and it started out being sort of more a Minsky-ish uh, approach. And uh, there was Roger Shank, who was, uh, talked about scripts and plans and goals in story understanding. Also, uh, a more procedural approach than the mathematicians were advocating. Um, so he started this thing in, nine, in 1985. It's still going on. He collected knowledge, and it, gradually it started out more in the procedural and frame-based representation camp. And then, as time went on, it got a little bit more mathematical. As to when he when he added to it mathematical reasoning methods that uh, work better on uh, large-scale knowledge. Okay, and this project is still going on. Um, so uh, one of the ways to describe this split is uh, <clears throat> that Roger Shank and Janet Klodner uh, wrote about was the neats versus the scruffies. So, and this was kind of a caricature, but um, you know, the neats are the well-organized, precise people. They need everything specified very precisely, and they come up with very accurate conclusions. And then the scruffies were, you know, opportunistic. They just decided you don't have to. Re you know, represent things exactly. It doesn't, everything doesn't have to be mathematically perfect and consistent, but they were able to get results and they were able to um, uh, have it more in line, be in line with the way humans did their internal thinking around these uh, problems, okay? And uh, so, so, you know, theorem proving is kind of the mathematical logic approach. The extreme end of the scruffy things now are things like information extraction. Uh, you know, where you go over a lot of uh, large amounts of natural language and you just pick out something every here and there, and most of it you just throw away and ignore, okay? Uh, and um, uh, in natural language processing, there's textual entailment, where you're just looking at various sentences and you say which one of those imply, seem to imply which other ones, and you don't really try to analyze what they're actually saying in the sentence. So, so that's kind of the extreme end of the scruffy thing. Um, I feel like I should be delivering this talk in a dirty t-shirt and torn jeans, uh, because uh, <clears throat> our approach is a little bit on the scruffy end, but maybe not as scruffy as, as, as some of those approaches. Um, and then what do we say about current machine learning? Well, I don't know how to analyze it on, on, uh, along that spectrum very well, because it depends on how you look at it. So on one hand, the, the mathematics of the machine learning is very neat. So, you know, it uses mathematical principles and theorems and all that stuff. On the other hand, 
it all, it just basically, you know, you're going to get whatever the data says, right? It's just pattern matching and data. So in that sense, if the data is very scruffy, the results are going to be very scruffy. So it has both aspects to it, and we can maybe come back to that question. Um, and, you know, in the general debate between the symbolic and the machine learning approaches, there's been a lot of hot air in it. I, just to tell, you know, to tell you where I'm coming from, I think really it's just a debate about whether you do top-down or bottom-up approaches. Okay. In general, both stories have to be right, right? Because the machine learning story, has, or the neural net story has to be right because basically we just got neurons in the head and that's it. So at some level that has to be right, correct. Okay. On the other hand, the top-down thing where you try to analyze it according to symbolic um, representations, that has to be right too, I think, because um, uh, the um, people think that way. They use language to express abstract concepts which are not directly observable from the data. And when we, we go about our daily problem solving, we think to ourselves that internal language has some use, we wouldn't have evolved it otherwise. And uh, the, uh, so there, there ha I think both stories have to be true. But I think in the research community, uh, some people enjoy working bottom up and some people enjoy working top down. And I think we, we need a kind of uh, uh, ecology of different approaches in the community. And I think there's no point in making it a, a big battle about it. It's just realizing that. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I come from the approach, the more symbolic, uh, more procedural approaches. So that's kind of my taste in research. Um, I think the best way of thinking about this trade-off is what Marvin Minsky called the causal diversity matrix. And uh, <clears throat> basically, you know, if you have two, if, if you just have a few causes and a few effects, then it's easy. If you have too many of both, then it's too hard. Right. And in between, and you have this stuff in between and uh, the symbolic stuff is kind of over here. And then, um, uh, you know, linear and statistical reasoning are when you have lots of causes and then not so many effects. Okay. So I think that's a good way of finding an overall balance of this stuff. Um, so uh, the project that I've been involved with for, <clears throat> you know, for, the, for a long time, a couple of decades is what we call concept and it's sort of a scruffy approach in the sense that um, we it's based on collecting assertions which kind of look like mathematical statements on the surface but they give the mathematicians a headache because they're not disambiguated we don't insist on consistency um, they don't obey all the mathematical rules that is necessary for axiomatic inference um, but nevertheless it is kind of a principled approach one way to look at it is uh, Take a statement like birds fly. So that's what we would have in our knowledge base. Okay. As a logical statement, it's not true because you got penguins and stuffed birds and dead chickens and all that stuff, which you would still call birds. So, and McCarthy had circumscription, but I think that was kind of a kludge. Um, uh, and on the other hand, you know, you take a statistical approach, but I don't think people are actually counting birds. You know, I think that that. Uh, there's that I think people come to those conclusions without actually measuring the instances and aggregating the instances. And so that might be controversial. Um, but uh, so I think we need a, a kind of third approach or a, a different way of thinking about common sense knowledge. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so some contrast between factual knowledge and common sense knowledge. Uh, common sense knowledge is vague, whereas factual knowledge tends to be precise. Uh, it's um, it's uh, highly structured in mathematics and natural language. There's also structure, but it's, it's more complicated. Um, uh, uh, knowledge comes from experts, mathematicians, or it comes from the general public. And um, I think this last point, I think, is very important, is that if you have very precise structured knowledge, you can organize it up front. So you put some effort up front into making it easier to then do interface inference with it on the back end. Whereas uh, in common sense knowledge, you're organizing it more on the fly. And it's, you know, mathematical knowledge wants to be context free. Okay. Common sense knowledge is contextual. Okay. And common sense gives you kind of the default context. That's the way of thinking about it. If you don't know anything else, you assume this, the context of common sense knowledge. Okay. So, um, uh, the, um, so the, our work on it was started with something called the open mind, 
which uh, Push Singh, I should have put his name also on there, uh, he was one of Marvin Minsky's graduate students, and this was kind of at the dawn of the web in the late 90s. And um, uh, just as graduate students are wonderful, you know, and sometimes they don't know what's impossible, so we just said, I'll put up a website and ask people to type in common sense. And we all thought, you know, including me, we all thought, oh, that's very funny. You know, nobody will do it, and the result will be a mess, and it won't be any use. Okay. But then very quickly, as, you know, happens in the crowdsourcing thing, we amassed a, a fairly substantial common sense knowledge base of a million things, uh, statements in English. And there were things like this. You were likely to find fruit in a kitchen. Um, an apple is a kind of fruit you would study because you have a test. Okay. And in the beginning, we just took it all in without doing too much processing. And then we asked ourselves, okay, what's, what's the structure in this? What do people usually say? And, um, and then we had an interface for, the, for a filling in, the, filling in pattern. So it would ask you, is it generally true? You're likely to find fruit in a restaurant because kitchens have restaurants. And so you can expand your knowledge by asking people these questions that extend the knowledge you already have. Uh, so we had a, and, and Catherine Vasey and Rob Spear uh, created uh, a set of uh, uh, games and interfaces that help people acquire this knowledge. Okay. Um, so it's a crowdsourced, uh, we kept this project running for at least 12 years and still running in some forms, and uh, we collected about a million English statements. Okay. And then, um, uh, whoops. Okay. So then we parsed it. And basically, we just parsed it very simply in kind of the information extraction way, and we threw away most of it. Uh, and then we noticed that there were about 20 different relations here is a part of that location used for, okay? And then we started looking at the various linguistic patterns that people use to express those relations. So those 25 relations, or however many, uh, expressed, you know, the great majority of what people considered common sense when you ask them. And asking people explicitly for common sense is a little bit different than just reading some text on, reading a news story on the web, because people are processing it and they're giving you what they think are the essential elements of common sense. Yes? I have a Wikipedia effect. You get a lot of information about stuff um, likely to fill out your forms, no, and less about other kinds of things? Probably yes, although we, you know, this was pretty widespread and we also had collaborators in other countries that set up their own website in their own language and, and uh, got the, did their own collections. And then we were able to do things like do cultural comparisons according to this. A quarter of the Brazilian knowledge base was about food, which, you know, shows something about cultural, you know. And we found that there were a lot of differences in culture in you know between in things like food and music and cultural things and then almost no difference there was only like five percent difference with chinese you know in things like uh just you know chair you know talking about chairs and table tables and you know physical objects and stuff so we did some cultural studies which turned out to be very very interesting on this um, so then we uh compiled it into something called ConceptNet. So it was a set of nodes, okay, uh, and then the, lo the links are these 20 relations. Okay. And, you know, the extent, the, the 20, there's nothing special about those 20. We added stuff for various domains, but the idea is that you have a small number of relations that account for most of the stuff. Okay. Um, so here we have knowledge about breakfast. You, before you eat breakfast, you have to wake up in the morning and then you're full, okay? You can drink coffee, you know, maybe you yawn, okay? And, and so this is the kind of, this is the, um, uh, <clears throat> the kind of, uh, uh, it's basically a semantic network, okay? We, again, we don't disambiguate it. There's a lot of redundancy in it and stuff. But the key thing to notice, I think, is just that the, the nodes of this are things like wake up in the morning. So it could be noun and verb phrases. So the knowledge is attached to noun and word verb phrases instead of, being attached to like single words, you know, and in things like psych, you know, you have these long German looking words, you know, uh, because they're trying to squeeze everything about a concept into one word, right? And, and so we do that explicitly. So, um, and, I, and I think the, so uh, 
it's very important that we're talking. And now, you know, there's all this stuff about word embedding and stuff. And we're trying to do things like concept embedding. So trying to build it up from just the word level to a level where you have ideas more or less expressed by noun and verb phrases. OK, because I think that's an important way that knowledge gets structured. Okay. What we never learned how to do, I think, in, in good old fashioned AI was we never learned how, I mean, we were great at rule based systems, we were great at frames, but we never really learned how to aggregate large numbers of these of these things. OK, and we always got combinatorial explosion, and, you know, and I think the real uh, value of a lot of the modern machine learning stuff is it's just much better at taking uh, little bits of evidence that come from a lot of places and agree, putting it all together to make some kind of overall judgment. And so why don't we, um, uh, why don't we kind of use both approaches so we can start out with a, you know, a richer representation, you know, than, than just words or strings, you know, we can start out with frames and semantic nets and stuff, and then use some of the modern machine learning techniques and mathematical techniques to do look, more kinds of aggregation than we were able to do uh, with you know simple rule based systems so uh if you think about you know most of the machine learning stuff and it's you know they were always taught the raw data that's operating on is always kind of occurrences of single events so a particular pixel in an image has that this value you know or uh um a word appears in this document at a certain place right and those are like singular events Okay. But if you're starting with common sense knowledge, you already have a big leg up. Okay. And the machine learning guys will say, well, you don't need to do that because you could use the machine learning to learn that stuff. Right. And they're right, except, you know, if you've already got human judgment there, why don't you, you know, start with a leg up rather than, you know, trying to build up from the absolute bottom. Okay. So, I mean, there are sometimes reasons to want to do that. If you have a system that's end to end differentiable, sometimes you can do things that you can, if it's not, you know, you could be wrong about the abstraction stuff, but in general, I think we get that. Um, if you start with strong, stronger stuff, then you get stronger stuff. And that's one of the, the things that we've learned about working with common sense knowledge. Um, so there were some, we did some projects in trying to, uh, 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 do inference with it. And um, uh, Rob's, Robin Spear uh, was one of um, my students. He did uh, this thing called analogy space, which is uh, basically the idea is you take all the knowledge you've got, okay, and you in some sense put it into a big box. And then what you can do is kind of, you can stretch and shrink and squash and slice that box. Okay. And so it's a multi-dimensional space, and there's various ways to construct those spaces. Okay? And then we use principal component analysis to split those space along various axes. Okay? That have that it turns out have fair semantic meaning. Okay? Um, so I can uh, just I'll show you a little snippet. Uh, and these days people are doing you know they're making these spaces with word vectors with um, uh, word embedding uh, vectors and stuff. Um, but we, we, we were doing this uh, early on, and I'll just show you one of my favorite uh, scenes from this uh, kind of thing. So what we're looking at is a, oops. <clears throat> so, uh, so this is about uh, 80,000 concepts, you know, splayed out to 100 dimensions and stuff, and then you know, squash down again to three. And we're looking at the principal, we're gonna, we're gonna take a, a, a trip down the principal axis of this, okay? So, um, so we're already at one end of the axis, we have car wrecks, death, disease, uh, misery, poison. What do those things have in common? They are bad, okay? <laughs> All right, so let's, uh, okay, so as we're going through this stuff, we get, now we're down to spilled milk, um, uh, you know, annoying, um, rotten tomatoes. Okay. So those things are still bad, but they're less bad. Okay. And now we get a big, whoa, so went fast here. We get a big clump in the center. Okay. And what is that clump? Well, that's things that we don't know whether they're good or bad. Okay. And now we're at the other end here, we get smell good, uh, 
healthy survive. Okay, and then uh, that, then if we keep going, you know, we get praise, achieve a goal, understand the world, long life, lots of money. Okay, so this is pretty amazing because, you know, what we have now is a function that given any concept tells you whether people think it's good or bad by kind of common sense. So if I give you ice cream, then, you know, it's probably going to come out on the good side of this. Um, uh, you know, not everybody likes ice cream. Some people are lactose intolerant or, you know, whatever, but... If you don't know anything about a person, you would assume that they would like ice cream. Okay, uh, so organizing things around this semantic dimension, these semantic dimensions, give us easy ways of making common sense judgments just like that. Okay, but of course they're subject to all these exceptions and stuff. So that's those are the kind of inference procedures that we're looking for. So um, and and you know we have some. Uh, other ways of uh, doing these things as well. Okay. So a traditional logical inference, you go from true assertion to true assertion via inference rules. So you're always in the true space. Okay. The problem is, of course, it goes, it blows up exponentially. And then it requires very precise definitions, which itself is hard. Uh, in concept that we have no definitions. We just have knowledge. Stuff is defined by the knowledge we have about, about it. Okay. And then the knowledge we, we have is defined by what our concepts are. So, um, uh, and, okay. And then, you know, another thing we try, we try to think about is joint inference, which is how do you put two knowledge bases together? And, you know, a lot of traditional machine learning stuff isn't very uh, uh, com composable in that way. Uh, in logic, then, you know, if you ask a logician about, well, how do you do that? They say, oh, it's just easy. You just put an and, you know, and conjoin the two sides. And since, you know, true and true is still true, then there's no problem. Okay. But in common sense knowledge, um, uh, combining knowledge is, is a, um, uh, takes a little bit more doing. Okay. You have, and uh, Catherine Avesi did a, uh, uh, thesis on uh, a technique called blending, and we're still thinking about that one. One of the hopes that we, so another thing about common sense is, common sense for who, right? Is it everybody in the world? Is it just Americans? Is it just Californians? Is it ISI people? So, you know, you can look at this in different ways, okay? And so what we want, so we're also thinking about kind of, maybe you could call it a revival of the expert system stuff, where one of the problems is expert system was brittle because it didn't have that base layer of common sense. So one thing you might do is take the general layer of common sense and then build up specialized layers on top of it for different groups of people who have specialized knowledge, but that can always fall back on the general common sense. And if you can do joint inference with these things, then uh, I think you, know, you have a, a good way to model expertise. Um, so this is the current, uh, so, uh, uh, Catherine Hedesi, who was a postdoc with me, and then uh, uh, Robin Spear, who was my PhD student and some other of my students, they uh, formed a company called Luminoso that does opinion analysis uh, <clears throat> for uh, commercial enterprises. And uh, they are maintaining ConceptNet as a uh, public resource. So uh, you can, uh, it's, uh, uh, which you can find at conceptnet.io, and I hope you guys will be interested in using it, okay? The current, version is a little bit different. It's concept net and, oh, and the other uh, sort of outgrowth I'd like to, of this I'd like to mention is a system called Web Child by uh, Nikhet Tandon, who I was on his thesis committee in Germany, and then uh, now he's at uh, Allen AI, okay? And it, it incorporates concept net and then has a lot of other stuff as well, some specialized knowledge bases about part whole and uh, comparative knowledge and activities and spatial knowledge and stuff. Um, so, uh, the, so there's two versions of concept that are a little bit different. Uh, one is the concept that five is the current public one. Concept that four is the one that we originally um, had. So that was a million assertions that we got from people who Mark said these things were common sense. Um, concept that five has combined it with WordNet, WikiDB, a lot of web resources. It handles a lot of languages. Uh, it's about 20, Five million uh, assertions, so it knows a lot more stuff. But sometimes, but we haven't completely thrown away the original because 
um, if, if sometimes you want to ask the question about what knowledge is common sense knowledge, if, you know, if you say, tell me three things about a cat, you'll say cats are pet, cats are furry, you know, whatever, cats sit in your lap, okay. But if, you know, if I know something very particular about a Persian cat, you know, that nobody, you know, not everybody knows, you know, it's going to be in some database. But if I just, you know, treat that the same as, you know, a cat is a pet, then I won't be able to distinguish between what knowledge is truly fundamental in terms of common sense. So, um, and then uh, one of the resources that Consumnet 5 has is, <coughs> um, it has kind of word embeddings or more properly concept embeddings that uh, are put in the same form as word to vec and gloves. So they're kind of um, uh, uh, plug compatible with them and they entered the semival contest uh, in 17 and, and they won that with that. So uh, those are some resources that are available. Um, uh, and then my personal interest is using common sense and user interface. And uh, people don't, I think, understand how unconstrained uh, you, interfaces are. So, you know, if you say open a file, well, which file? I don't know. I got a million files on my disk. You could open any of them, right? But some might make more sense in the context that I'm working than others, okay? So you want to try to use common sense to sort of constrain the choices that you have in interfaces or make more intelligent defaults uh, to help the system give you, to recommend your systems. When you make what we call goal-oriented interfaces, where you're using the interface to accomplish a goal and the system is helping you do it. Uh, and I, I think some issues that are very important to me are end user programming, programming by example, and debugging. Because I think one of the biggest problems we have in all our computer systems is we don't have good ways of fi fixing them when they go wrong. Um, so uh, we have a long list of uh, uh, applications areas that we, we've done with this. Uh, in um, uh, media libraries, control of consumer electronics, uh, various kinds of recommendation systems, language learning, health and customer service, so forth. So, um, uh, and, and we started out with um, uh, there were, uh, Hugo Liu, uh, to just a little bit about the history of ConceptNet. So, uh, Open Mind, you know, produced this, this, um, all this, uh, not all this uh, uh, common sense knowledge, and then. Uh, we were implementing a kind of photo library agent where you could uh, write a, a, a letter and put photographs in, write an email, put photographs in. And then what we wanted to do is read this and then select things from your photo library and put them in. So Hugo developed ConceptNet as kind of the, the internal data structure for this application <laughs> called ARIA. And that's how it originated. Um, and then uh, we did a number of systems. Uh, Peggy Chi did a system with... Uh, uh, a chat system, which again was reading it, and it had some story patterns into it. So, if you understand, if you said um, a surprising thing happened to me today, then it would try to choose, according to common sense, things that were, that it could consider surprising. Or you said, unfortunately, uh, I lost my wallet. You know, and it would try to understand a little bit about uh, what that would mean in terms of the story you were trying to tell, and then select uh, pictures appropriately. Um, we had we did a meta, uh, John Moore, who was a doctor, did a medical interview system, that uh, which to in, uh, do um, talking about uh, things like when patients talk about pain, they often talk about it metaphorically. They say it feels like an elephant on my chest, or it feels like somebody stuck a knife in me and twisted it. Right? You know, they you know the hospital form where they say pain on a scale of one to ten, not very informative really. Okay, or it has a, things like lacinating pain. Well, you know, a patient is gonna not, not going to know what that means. So people speak metaphorically, and we had an on-screen character that uh, if you say my pain is like a chainsaw, right, that's not going to be on the form, right? But you know a chainsaw can cut, a chainsaw buzzes, so oh, does that mean the pain is varying, right? So you try to uh, use some metaphorical things to direct uh, the, um, the dialogue about that. Okay, so these are just a few examples of some of the uh, interesting systems we did. Um, uh, <clears throat> all right, Earl Wagner uh, did a system called Woodstein, which we would call the end user debugging. So it's how do you debug something when there's no program? Okay. And this was for debugging web interactions. So we had a browser that tracked your uh, web interactions. And then, you know, if like, let's say you ordered something and you, the <coughs> shipment didn't arrive and you want to know why. Okay, so you have to debug bug it. And so what it did was it tried to, it had common sense knowledge about 
A purchase involves uh, selecting merchandise, uh, paying for it, and then getting it delivered. Okay, so this was a kind of common sense template which we then mapped to various parts of a web page. So when something goes wrong, then it, cre it, it creates this explanation. So this is like a stack trace. It said you were purchasing, you placed an order, uh, you browsed Amazon, you know, you selected a shipping method, okay? And then the stuff in yellow is the things where it thinks that something might have gone wrong, okay? And uh, so we construct an explanation by using a common sense, by matching a common sense model to the interaction history. And then we let you browse the interaction history using that. And it's essentially a debugger when you don't have a program. Okay. And this is relevant to all the stuff about explainable AI, which I'll get to also. Um, uh, we're also trying to bring some of these ideas to, um, uh, to kind of more traditional machine learning workflows. Uh, and uh, my student Karthik Danakar uh, uh, introduced a new machine learning technique, which we call lensing. Okay. And the idea is a lens is a kind of perspective or point of view. Okay, and what we want to do is use some machine learning to extract that point of view and then maybe apply it somewhere else or contrast it with different points of view and so forth. And the way we do that is what you have to remember about the machine learning thing is it's just a pattern matcher, right? And so it can only match patterns that are in the data. It can't match patterns that are in the user's head. So we have an interactive loop where we run some machine learning stuff, then we get some results and we design a cognitive task for the user that helps the user give feedback that helps understand the discrepancy between the systems models and the user model. And then we can feed that back and modify things. And you have to interact with the user like to that because the machine learning model is always incomplete and the model is in the user's head and you have to interact with the user. Otherwise, you're not going to learn that. And uh, so this was in for a psychological uh, application, uh, psychology application where um, we generate a topic model using LDA, and then, uh, you know, and then we have the story, I'm pregnant, I'm in my third semester, or I'm a birth control because I don't, you know. And so we, these are the, this is the actual natural language text. We get the topic models, and then we ask people, well, what's going on in this thing? What is this you patient concerned about? You know, what is the thing? And then we get some feedback from that, and then we have a way of creating a lens with that, which represents the differences or the ratios, I guess you could call it, between the, the machine's model and the human's model, and then we can use that to provide feedback. Um, and this was an application that we did for analyzing a chat for online counselors, analyzing a chat, and they get a real-time topic model uh, uh, of, of the, um, as people are talking in the chat, it analyzes, and often they refer to things that have happened before in the chat or before the, the stuff the counselor doesn't know about. So we give people a real-time display, and then if they, so, you know, if, if uh, they're talking about self-injuring behavior, or there was a history of self-injuring behavior, <laughs> then those things are red flags, and the counselor has to take note of that. Um, <clears throat> so if this is more recent work that we were working with uh, uh, my student Brian Williams and working with Patrick Winston. How many of you heard about the Genesis story understanding system? No, okay. This is isn't Patrick Winston has been working on the system for decades. And it's basically a uh, rule-based uh, story understanding system. And basically we, we put we were putting common sense into it to see if it improved it or helped with it. And it, and it, it did. So we were quite happy about that. And uh, basically it has two parts. So one part is sort of a pretty traditional rule-based uh, story understanding system that understands plot story patterns and plot units, things like revenge. So revenge is A harms B, and then B gets angry, and then B wants to harm A. Right. Okay. And there can be various uh, 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 derivatives of that, like thwarted revenge and pyrrhic victory, and you know you can build up those scenarios and stuff. And then you want to be able to match them to a story. Okay. So we uh, extend to that matching. And then we also, and basically what Genesis does is it, it looks, it um, analyzes events, actors, goals, plans, and so forth. And then we, uh, but, you know, the rules are very sparse. You know, it's hard to write rules and there are not too many of them. So we're using common sense to kind of fill in the gaps. Okay. So uh, the main uh, structure in Genesis is a thing called an elaboration graph, which is just a sequence of events and uh, 
<laughs> when a character takes some action to achieve some goal, it works or it doesn't and stuff. And then we have, it creates a graph of dependencies of the events. I'll show a better example of that. Um, uh, it, Genesis has a lot of, of capabilities. It can uh, do hypothetical reasoning. It can do, it could say, what's the, the American perspective on this or the Chinese perspective on that? Uh, it can do analogical reasoning. It can do story generation. So there's a, you know, it's a very, very impressive system. I think maybe the most impressive of the rule-based story understanding systems. Um, uh, and so I'll give you an example of that. So you feed stories into it by, you know, just a very constrained natural language. This is a story about the Mexican-American Mexican War. The United States is a country. Mexico is a country. Uh, the United States captures Mexico City. So it's a very kind of bare bones way of saying what the events in the story are. Okay. Uh, so then we get an elaboration graph. The United States has ambition. The United States captures Mexico City. Okay. The United States wins the war. Okay. So the and then these are uh, these are various. And so it's just a sequence of the events. The ones in white are the ones that are actually supported by events in the story. Okay. The ones in uh, magenta are ones that um, uh, that uh, uh, that that are inferred using the common sense. So, so because it's hard to really write enough rules to get every, you know, usually you can get a few, but it's hard enough to really write enough rules that you get the connection. So we're filling in that stuff uh, by uh, using common sense knowledge about goals and plans and actions and stuff. Um, the other thing it does is improves the matching. Okay. So uh, in the matching, if you say A harms B, well, what does that mean? Did A punch B? Did A stab B? You know, so we, we were matching stories about cyberbullying. So uh, things like um, uh, my, uh, my girlfriend and I broke up. Uh, uh, she posted nude pictures of me on the web. Okay, well, that's, that's harm. Right. But you have to go to, you know, nude pictures and tra posting pictures and trash talking and so forth to harm. And it's hard to write enough rules that 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 cover all that stuff. And so content that sort of gets it in one swell foop. Okay. The other thing uh, is that, you know, this is important about explanation. Um, uh, so we can answer questions about what were the motivations for various uh, events in the story. Uh, and that gets me to the subject of explainable AI, which, you know, and um, uh, the, <laughs> when I talk to sometimes, you know, people in industry or government people, you know, about explainable, I mean, I love the idea of explainable AI, and I think it's, we should all be working on that and stuff. But sometimes I get the, the impression that really what they want is excusable AI. They really want to, you know, have some AI program that's designed to make the most profit or exert the most control or something. And then they want to be able to give some story that, you know, gets the dogs to swallow the dog food. And that to me is not truly explainable AI. Um, uh, it's excusable AI because they were looking for some excuse. Okay. I think for AI to be, you know, explainable, there has to be some real use that you can make of the explanation. And, you know, if you're powerless, somebody just gives you an AI system, you're obliged to use it, then you have no control and no feedback. I think that it's important that you, that there's something you can do with the explanation that helps you. Okay. And um, uh, so, and of course it's not always possible because, you know, in machine learning, you know, you have lots and lots of causes that contribute to a small number of effects. Sometimes it's just too complicated to explain. And if that's the case, that's the breaks. There's not much you can do. Okay. And so people have explored, and I was looking at the uh, XAI DARPA program, and, you know, there are some, you know, approaches that people take to this, which are not bad. You know, there are things like, you, so a lot of it is about visualization of machine learning data structures. So if you've got a neural network, you visualize the layers. Okay. But that's only really helpful for the experts. Okay? It doesn't really help the end users that much. Sometimes, you can understand some simple models, like simple neural net models, but you can't understand the complicated ones. So you look for ways to break up the complicated models into simpler ones. Um, if, you, if the thing is completely a black box, well, maybe you can't get inside it at all, but you could do kind of experiments where you say, okay, we'll try something, see how it works. And then the user can build up a mental model of it, 
without knowing its internals. And in some sense, we all do that because I can't get inside your head and figure out what, how you're doing your reasoning. I have to just ask you things or observe your behavior. Okay. Um, and then another thing you can do is select good examples to present to the user. And this is small here, but this is Salima, Asertion, Salima Amershi at um, University of Washington and Microsoft. She uh, uh, built a, a debugger system for a classifier, which shows you all the pictures, and then it shows you the ones that are classified, positive and negative. As you change stuff, you can move stuff from one to the other. Then uh, you can use the examples to control it, and you hope there's enough regularity between your model and the system's model that you know it can infer from your actions some feedback. Okay. Um, but in common sense, what we really want to do is, you know, to the extent that it's possible, give you a story about how stuff happened. That this happened because, you know, and it let you envision the steps that lead up to the explainability that you want. Okay. And this, the thing that this does is it relates the how to the why. The why is typically people's goals, people's preferences and stuff that are not explicitly represented. But that's what you need to know, you know, and looking at the neural network layers, that's not going to help you. You know, even examples, you know, it's a good point to start, but, you know, you really want to know how the how relates to the why. That's the important, essential thing of an explanation. If you have individual steps in the explanation, they're often justifiable by appeal to common sense. You know, if I tell you um, <clears throat> uh, that uh, the plane was late because there was bad weather. OK, you know, you could envision, yeah, OK, if it was bad weather and I was the pilot, I wouldn't want to be flying in that weather. Okay. So you can accept that as an explanation. Um, yes, but yeah, yeah, I'm almost done. OK, so uh, and I think it serves as a sanity check. So, you know, computers are notorious for, um, uh, you know, writing you checks for zero dollars and zero cents because they don't understand the purpose of a check is to pay somebody some 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 of it. So uh, you can use it as a sanity check. And then the other thing is what happens when there's a discrepancy? So you think common sense is one thing, and then actually the AI system does something else. Okay, there's two possibilities there. One is it's doing some fantastic discovery and you learn something new, and you should be grateful for the AI system to have violated your common sense. Okay. The other thing is just, well, there's a bug. Okay? And you have to be able to understand the difference between those things. So I'll give you one example. The um, dating system, uh, OK Cupid. Okay, they uh, said they asked men and women, you know, what do you want to know about your partner? Okay, and they asked the men, and they said, will she have sex with me? <laughs> okay, and you know, all right, well, that's kind of you know, I mean, but um, that was what they said. Okay? And then they said, okay, let's go look at the questions that women answer and see which are more most correlated with she'll have sex with me. Okay. And the answer they got was, do you like the taste of beer? Not do you like beer, but do you like the taste of beer? Okay. Now, uh, and then, you know, will you, yeah, so this was the, the thing. Now, what do we think about an example like that? Okay. Either we discovered something really new about uh, women's sexuality, right? Or I think the more likely thing is there was a bug somewhere. Okay, and so we need the explanation to be able to figure out which of those two cases there was. If you can't come up with some explanation uh, for it, for, for that kind of a result, then the answer is probably, you know, you just had a bug. Um, uh, so using common sense for explanation gives you guidance for usage, because if you learn a machine learning model, you know, then how do you know when I'm going to use it? I want it to work for me. I don't give a damn about, you know, all the stuff it was trained on. Right? So, you know, to give feedback. So if somebody asked me, is this AI system doing a good job? If I don't know what it was thinking, I don't, can't give it, give it, you know, feedback. Okay? Debugging, I just explained that, right? Um, cost, and then, you know, what I want to get to is customization and user programming. So not just that somebody's going to give you an AI system and explain it, but if it doesn't do what you want or doesn't meet your needs, you have the ability to interact with it and get it to do what you want yourself without going through developers and retraining and all that other stuff. Uh, so that's it. So, um, uh, that's, so that's just some of my perspective. I mean, I know I went through a lot of stuff. I'm happy to talk about more specifics, but um, uh, I'm very excited about uh, the prospects of making progress in common sense knowledge. I think we will get there. 
Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I was really happy that Pedro gave me the invitation to work with you guys. So, um, uh, so I'd like to learn, you know, in the course of today, what you guys are thinking, what you guys are doing, and how I can help. Um, so just to give you a little, t I don't know how many of you know about the Mobley project, but uh, just to give you a little taste of one of the evaluations was uh, they had these challenge problems here. And there were things like, on stage, a woman takes a seat at the piano. She, and then we have sits on a bench, uh, smiles with someone who's in the crowd, nervously sets her, her fingers. OK, what's the answer here? D. OK, so that was the answer. Notice that the other answers are not impossible. There mo might be circumstances in which case that, that would make those true. OK, but if we have, you know, common sense knowledge expressed, you know, and if I asked you why the answer, you know, why, we, why did you choose answer D, you would explain it in terms of common sense. Well, musicians are on stages. When people are on the stage, they get nervous. You know, the piano is a musical instrument and stuff. So I think when people think these questions through, they're actually going through common sense. And so that's where we need to look to be successful at this stuff. Thank you. Five minutes for questions. So, uh, question. so I have a question. Go ahead. So in the in the crowdsource, so you got a million statements. Is there a way to characterize your know, a million statements like fifty percent of what we need for common sense knowledge, ninety percent? Good. Good. Okay. All right. So this is a question. You know, how much common sense knowledge is there? Okay. Well, nobody knows. Okay. But a person lives for three billion seconds. Okay. So you know, could you know a billion things in common sense knowledge? You know, expressed this way. Probably not. You know, you probably don't learn a billion of those. You know, you're probably not born with very many of these. Okay. So somewhere you got to pick up. You know, so a billion is probably too much. Okay, a million is too few. You know, because we know how bad our current thing is. You know, even thirty million is too few. Uh, so I, but you know, so what's the answer? So I don't know. Probably between ten million and a hundred million. So that's you know, it seems like it's a large but feasible number. Yeah. There's a sort of follow-up. If you took Psych or Open Psych and translated right. what it has, the kind of concept net sort of phrases, would Good. you get? A ham sandwich is something you eat when you're hungry, or what is the overlap, or what is the good? Good, yeah. So, uh, so um, I wouldn't be surprised if you know, uh, Psych and you know, uh, Google Knowledge Graph and all these things already have concept net in them, right? Because you know, we make it open source. You know, these guys probably looked at this stuff and and downloaded it. You know, I, I would. Can't imagine they wouldn't. But the entity okay. classes are very different, right? Like ham sandwich is just a right. crucial phrase of yours, and for them, it's some, something more common. Well, then now you go. So, you know, when people have asked us, why don't you put out an RDF thing of concept? I think we did at one point, but the problem is that, you know, translate, if you have a thing where, you know, cycle is a very, you know, precise language and stuff, and then somebody gives you a ham sandwich satisfies, you know, how do you put that in, right? It might not have the concepts. You know, you might want not want to put on birds fly because you want to take account of all the exceptions. So those are the problems with kind of just, you know, willy nilly transferring that. We did take a, a common sense. Uh, one of the we did uh, have some cooperations with um, uh, Eric Mueller's uh, Thought Treasure, which was, you know, between Psych and Open Mind and Thought Treasure. Those are kind of the three big ones for a long time. But we did take Thought Treasure and you know put it all in uh, at CMU. Um, they had this uh, verbosity game, which was a little common sense elicitation game. Uh, they, uh, uh, Luis Fanon, he gave us his data. We put some of that stuff in there. So that's one of the ways in which that 1 million became 28 million in, in the current concept. Net. So there is some sharing of this. And again, I don't know who, uh, Tandon, I was on his thesis committee. He, you know, processed concept net in some way to add to his web child thing. Uh, so there has been a fair amount of uh, cross pollination. Yeah. So who judges uh, what qualifies common sense? Uh, Good question. And you know, our answer is kind of nobody. Okay. So um, remarkably, we had 
very few malicious attempts over the you know we ran the stuff was up for you know quite a long time um, there was only one or two instances I could remember where uh, uh, we were you know seriously attacked I mean we took out the fuck yous you know that wasn't too hard uh, <clears throat> but um, uh, <clears throat> there was only one or two serious attempts that I can remember where uh, <clears throat> that somebody actually tried to uh, you know, make a bot that created multiple accounts that tried to attack it, you know, in that way. But we were pretty able, you know, by some of the inference techniques, you know, we were pretty able to see which were the bot accounts and not, and we cleaned it up. So, so you know, there's a case, it's still very noisy. There's a lot of noise in there, but we never uh, did a thing where we actually went through and verified each one. Uh, in the Brazilian knowledge base that was put together by uh, Junior Anacleto, uh, the University of Sao Carlos, Brazil, uh, they actually, they had, um, I think they had maybe a quarter of a million uh, statements, so it wasn't as big as ours, but they had students look at every single one. Uh, and so they had, they achieved a, a, a higher quality there. But in general, we've been pretty lucky. We haven't had a lot of bad stuff. And even when we do have bad stuff, it tends to drop out because it's not correlate, corroborated by other stuff that we have. Yes? Yeah, well, I mean, if you can predict the correct answer over a lot of over a wide range of stuff, that's pretty good. So, you know, I don't want to knock it, you know, uh, but it's true that, you know, in general, they um, they don't, um, uh, you know, they're, they're weaker on the explanation parts of it. You know, there are also, you know, you can ask people for explanations and then you can run a machine learning thing on that. That's another approach that can be done. Uh, but in general, what we want to try to do is, uh, and I think there are a lot of different kind of hybrid approaches that you might adopt for that, you know, and maybe we'll explore. Uh, but I think that's the, um, you know, I think you want to base it on common sense. Sometimes the machine learning stuff comes up with abstractions, which are actually better at predicting, but they don't make any sense to a human. Uh, and, and therefore, they're not really good at explanation. So that, so, you know, they can generate something which is an explanation in the predictive sense, that is, it's causally related to the answer that came out. But if it's not, if it's not understandable to a human, then it kind of doesn't really work effectively as an explanation. So you're kind of back to distinguishing the common sense explanations from the ones that are simply predictive. Okay. Yeah. Uh -oh. Maybe one more question, last question. Uh, last question. Yeah, okay. Where's the scruffiness located? Um, the, you know, it still seems like having yeah. a piece of common sense that, that represents some sort of truth. Yeah, we're not, so I, I would say we're not really so interested in truth as, you know, there's another concept, I don't really know what to call it, but maybe plausibility is the closest word. So, you know, uh, so if I, and I can ask you a question like something like, do cats, do uh, dogs eat pizza? Okay. Maybe you don't know the answer to that question. Okay. And maybe you can imagine, well, uh, you know, uh, or, huh? If they're hungry. Yeah, if they're hungry enough, or, you know, I don't know, you know, they, maybe they, you know. So you, you could think of various scenarios and routes and envisionings that might be, you know, okay, well, you know, I threw a piece of pizza at my dog and he didn't like it, you know. So maybe dogs in general don't eat pizza, okay. Could be that dog didn't like it, you know. You don't know. So uh, you, that's kind of where, you know, you're not trying to make a, a, a logic, you're just trying to say, is it plausible? Is it consistent with what I know? You know, that that's, I think you're not going for truth in an absolute sense. So one thing, one, being able to predict the correct answer in the machine learning sense, that doesn't capture it. Uh, I don't even know what to call it, but I think the concept that we're interested in is not so much truth. It's related, you know, 
You want things to be true, obviously. True is better than not true. But human not reasoning is so uncertain that sometimes you have to accept less than the truth. And, and, yeah. and that's what we're kind of aiming for. Plausibility is kind of a logic unto itself as well. You still end up getting rules that tell you how to deal with plausibility. Yeah, and then you can say, well, things are, that are more probable or more plausible, but, you know, and there's an argument as to whether that's, whether you could replace pro, pro, plausibility by probability, you know, that's where we're at. But I think we're, the closest thing that I can say to what we're aiming for is plausibility. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.